Contents of A Dead Man's Pocket, Part 3, by Jack Finney. A fraction of his mind knew he was going to fall, and he began taking rapid blind steps with no feeling of what he was doing, sliding with a clumsy, desperate swiftness, fingers scrabbling along the brick, almost hopelessly resigned to the sudden backward pull and swift motion outward and down. Then his moving left hand slid in onto not brick but sheer emptiness, an impossible gap in the face of the wall, and he stumbled. His right foot smashed into his left knee, left ankle bone. He staggered sideways, began falling, and the claw of his hand cracked against the glass and wood. He slid down it, and his fingertips were pressed hard on the puttyless edging of his window. His right hand smacked gropingly beside it as he fell to his knees, and under the full weight and direct downward pull of his sagging body, the open window dropped shudderingly in its frame till it closed and his wrists stuck to the sill and were jarred off. For a single moment, he knelt, knee bones against stone on the very edge of the ledge, body swaying and touching, nowhere else fighting for balance, then he lost it, his shoulders plunging backward and he flung his arms forward, his hand smashing against the window, casing on either side, and his body moving backward, his fingers clutched the narrow wood stripping of the upper pane. For an instant, he hung suspended between balance and falling. His fingertips pressed onto the quarter-inch wood strips. Then, with utmost delicacy, with a focused concentration of all his senses, he increased even further the strain on his fingertips, hooked to these slim edgings of wood. Elbows slowly bending, he began to draw the full weight of his upper body forward, knowing that the instant his fingers slipped off these quarter-inch strips, he'd plunge backward and be falling. Elbows imperceptibly bending, body shaking with the strain, the sweat starting from his forehead in great sudden drops. He pulled his entire being and thought concentrated in his fingertips. Then, suddenly, the strain slackened and ended, his chest touching the windowsill, and he was kneeling on the edge, ledge, by his forehead pressed to the glass of the closed window. Dropping his palms to the sill, he stared into his living room at the red-brown Davenport across the room and a magazine he had left there at the pictures on the walls, and the gray rug, the entrance to the hallway, and at his papers, typewriter, and desk not two feet from his nose. A movement from his desk caught his eye, and he saw that it was a thin curl of blue smoke. His cigarette, the ash long, was still burning in the ashtray where he left it. This was past all belief, only a few minutes before. His head moved, and in faint reflection from the glass before him, he saw the yellow paper clenched in his front teeth, lifting a hand from the sill. He took it from his mouth, the moistened corner parted from the paper, and he spat it out. For a moment in the light from the living room, he stared wonderingly at the yellow sheet in the hand, and then crushed it into the side pocket of his jacket. He couldn't open the window. It had been pulled not completely closed but its lower edge was below the level of the outside seal. There was no room to get his fingers underneath it. Between the upper sash and the lower was a gap not wide enough, reaching up. As he tried to get his fingertips on into, he couldn't push it open. The upper window panel, he knew from long experience, was impossible to move frozen tight with dry paint. Very carefully, observing his balance, the fingertips of his left hand, again, Hooked to the narrow stripping of the window casing. He drew back his right hand, palm facing glass, and then struck the glass with the heel of his hand. His arm rebounded from the pain, his body tottering, and he knew he didn't dare strike a harder blow. But in the security and relief of his new position, he simply smiled with only a sheet of glass between him and the room just before him. It was not impossible that there wasn't a way past it. Eyes narrowing. He thought for a few moments about what to do. Then his eyes widened for nothing occurred to him. But still he felt calm. The trembling, he realized, had stopped. At the back of his mind, there still lay the thought that once he was again in his home, he could give release to his feelings. He actually would lie on the floor, rolling, clenching tufts of the rug in his hands. He would literally run across the room, free to move as he liked, jumping on the floor, testing and reveling in the absolute security Letting the relief flood through him, draining the fear from his mind and body, his yearning for it, this was astonishingly intense. And somehow he understood that he had better keep his feeling at bay. 
He took a half dollar from his pocket and struck it against the pane, but without any hope that the glass would break, and with very little disappointment when it did not. After a few moments of thought, he drew his leg onto the ledge and picked the loose, the knot of his shoelace. He slipped off the shoe and holding it across the instep, drew back his arm as far as he dared and struck a leather heel against the glass. The pain rattled, but he knew it had been a long way from breaking it. His foot was cold and he slipped the shoe back on. He shouted again experimentally and then once more, but there was no answer. The realization slowly struck him that he might have to wait there here till Claire came home. And for a moment, she, the thought was funny. You could see Claire opening the front door, withdrawing her key from the lock, closing the door behind her, and then glancing up to see him crouched on the other side of the window. You could see her rush across the room, face astounded and frightened, and hear himself shouting instructions. Never mind how I got here. Just open the wind. She couldn't open it. He remembers she'd never been able to. She'd always had to call him. She had to get the building superintendent or neighbor, and he pictured himself smiling and answering the questions as he climbed in. I just wanted to get a breath of fresh air, so he couldn't possibly wait here till Claire came home. It was the second feature she wanted to see, and she left in time to see the first. She'd be in another three hours, or he glanced at his watch. Claire had been gone only eight minutes. It was impossible, but only eight minutes ago, he had kissed his wife goodbye. She wasn't even in the theater yet. It would be four hours before she could possibly be home, and he tried to picture himself kneeling out here, fingertips hooked to these narrow strippings, while first one movie, preceded by a slow listing of credits, began, developed, reached its climax, and then finally ended. There'd be a newsreel next, maybe, and then in an animated cartoon, and then in interminable scenes from coming feature, pictures, and then, once more, the beginning of a full-length picture, while all the time he hung out here in the night. He might possibly get in to his feet, but he was afraid to try. Already his legs were cramped, his thigh muscles tired, his knees hurt, his feet felt numb, and his hands were stiff. He couldn't possibly stay out here for four hours or anywhere near it. Long before that, his legs and arms would give out. He would be forced to try changing his position often, stiffly, clumsily, his coordination and strength gone, and he would fall quite realistically. He knew that he would fall. No one could stay out here on, his, on this ledge for four hours. A dozen windows in the apartment buildings across the street were lighted. Looking over his shoulder, he could see the top of a man's head behind a newspaper he was reading. In another window, he saw the blue-gray flicker of a television screen. No more than 20 yards from his back were scores of people, and if just one of them walked idly to this window and glanced out for some moments, he stared over his shoulder at the lighted re rectangles waiting. But no one appeared. The man reading his newspaper turned a page and then continued his reading. The figure passed another of the windows and was immediately gone. In the inside pocket of his jacket, he found a little sheaf of papers. And he pulled one out and looked at it in the light from the living room. It was an old letter, an advertisement of some sort. His name and address in purple ink were on the label pasted to the envelope. Gripping one end of the envelopes in his teeth, he twisted it into a tight curl. From a shirt pocket, he brought out a book of matches. Didn't dare let go of the casing with both hands. With the twist of paper in his teeth, he opened the matchbook with his free hand. Then he bent one of his matches in two without tearing it from the folder. It's red-tipped. And now touching the striking surface with his thumb, he rubbed the red tip acro across the striking area. He did it again, then again, and still again, pressing harder each time. And the match suddenly flared, burning his thumb. But he kept it all alight, cupping the matchbook in his hand and shielding it with his body. He held the flame to the paper in his mouth till he caught it caught. Then he snuffed out the match flame with his thumb, informed being careless of the burn, and replaced the book in his pocket. Taking the paper twist in his hand, he held it down, fl it flamed down, watching the flame crawl up the paper till it flared bright. Then he held it behind him over the street, moving it from side to side, watching it over his shoulder, the flame flickering and guttering in the wind. There were three letters in his pocket, and he lighted each one of them holding each till the flame touched his hand and then dropping it to the street below. At one point, watching over his shoulder while the last of the letters burned, he saw the man across the street put down his paper and stand, even seeming to Tom to glance toward his window. But then, when he moved, he was the only one to walk across the room and disappear from sight. There were a dozen coins in Tom Bennick's pocket, 
and he dropped them three or four times of time. But if they struck anyone or if anyone noticed their falling, no one connected them with their source and no one glanced upward. His arms had begun to tremble from the steady strain of clinging to his arable perch, and he did not know what to do now. I was terribly frightened. Clinging to the window stripping with one hand, he again searched his pockets, but now he had left his wallet on his dresser when he changed clothes. There was nothing left but the yellow sheet. It occurred to him irreverently that his death on the sidewalk below would be an internal mystery. The window closed. Why? How? And from where could have he, he could have fallen? No one would be able to identify his body for a time either. The thought was somehow unbearable and increased his fear. All they find in his pockets would be yellow sheet. Co contents of a dead man's pocket, he thought. One sheet of paper bearing penciled notations. Incomprehensible. He understood fully that he might actually be, going, actually be going to die. His arms, maintaining his balance on the ledge, were trembling steadily. And it occurred to him then, with all the force of a revelation, that if he fell, he was he was ever going to have out of a life he would then abruptly have had. Nothing then could ever be changed, and nothing more, no least experience or pleasure, could ever be added to his life. He wished then that he had not allowed his wife to go off by herself tonight and on similar nights. He thought of all the evenings he had spent away from her working, and he regretted them. He thought wonderingly of his fierce ambition and of the direction his life had taken. He thought of the hours he spent by himself filling the yellow sheet that had brought him out here. Contents of a dead man's pocket, he thought with sudden fierce and anger, a wasted life. He was simply not going to clean here till he slipped and fell. He told himself that now. There was one last thing he could try. He had been aware of it for some moments, refusing to think about it, but now he faced it. Kneeling here on the edge, the fingertips of one hand pressed to the narrow strip of the wood, he could, he knew, draw his other hand back a yard, perhaps, for fist clenched tight, doing it very slowly till he tensed the outer limit of the balance, then as hard as he was able from the distance, he could drive his fist toward against the glass if it broke. His fist smashing through, he was safe. He might cut himself badly and probably would, but with his arm inside the room, he would he would be secure. And if the glass did not break, the rebound flinging his arm would topple him off the ledge. He was certain of that. It occurred to him that he could raise his arm over his head to bring it down against the glass, but experimentally in slow motion, he knew it would be an awkward blow without the force of a driving punch, and not nearly enough to break the glass. Facing the window, he had to drive a blow from a shoulder. He knew now at a distance of less than two feet, and he did not know whether it would break through the heavy glass. It might. He could picture it happening. He could feel it in his nerves of his arm, and he might not. He could feel that too. Feel his fist striking his glass and being instantaneously flung back by the unbreaking pain. Feel the fingers of his other hand breaking loose, nails sc scraping along the casing as he fell. He waited, arm drawn back, fist balled, but no hurry to strike. This pause, he knew, might be an extension of his life. And to live even a few seconds longer, he felt he got out here on this ledge at night was in infinitely better than to die a moment later than he had to. His arm grew tired and he brought it down and rested it. Then he knew it was time to make the attempt. He could kneel here, hesitating indefinitely until he lost all courage to act. Waiting till he slipped off the ledge, he again he drew back his arm, knowing this time that he could not bring it down till he struck, his elbow protruding over Lexington Avenue, Far below the fingers of his other's hand, pressed down bloodlessly tight against the narrow stripping, he waited, feeling the sick tenseness, terrible excitement building. It grew and swelled toward the moment of action, his nerves tautening. He thought of Claire, just a wordless yearning thought, and then drew his arm back just a bit more, fist so tight his fingers pained him, and knowing he was going to do it, then with full power, with every last scrap of strength he could bring to bear, he shot his arm forward toward the glass, and he said, Claire! He heard the sound, felt the blow, felt himself falling forward, and his hand closed on the living room curtains, the shards and fragments of glass showering onto the floor. And then kneeling there on the ledge, an arm thrust into the room up to the shoulder, he began picking away the protruding silver slivers and great wedges of glass from the window frame, tossing them in, onto the ground rug. And as he grasped the edges of the empty window frame and climbed into his home, he was grinning in triumph. He did not lie down on the floor or run through the apartment as he had promised himself. Even in the first few moments, it seemed to him natural and normal that he could be there he was. 
He simply turned to his desk, pulled the crumpled yellow sheet from his pocket and laid it down where it had been, smoothing it out. Then he absently laid a pencil across it to weigh it down. He shook his head wonderingly and turned to walk toward the closet. There he got out his top coat and hat and without waiting to put it on, opened the front door and stepped out to go find his wife. He turned to pull the door closed and warm air from the hall rushed through the narrow opening again. As we saw the yellow paper, the pencil flying sco scooped off the desk and un impeded by the glassless window, sail out into the night and out of his life. Top etiquette burst la into laughter and then closed the door behind him. This is the end of Contents of a Dead Man's Pocket, part three.